Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Australian Chinese Art and Culture at Western Sydney University. I'm Professor Jin Han, the director of the Institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Parramatta South campus, which is on the country of the Darug people of the Darug nation, and acknowledge their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of the country for thousands of years. And we would like to pay our respects to the First Nations elders of the countries we are all sitting on today, past, present, and emerging. I just want to acknowledge that the music you just heard is from um, the very famous musician called Tony Wheeler. It's just so beautiful. Welcome to RAC Art Talks. Today we are having lecture three, Chance Encounters, Untold Tales of Great Journeys Made by Some Chinese Paintings Found in Australia by Yvette Klein. I first met Yvette a couple of years ago at ATASA, the Asian Art Society of Australia Management Committee, where Yvette gave a brief presentation on the structures of a traditional Chinese painting, which I found very impressive. I have since met several people who know and speak highly of Yvette about her authoritative experiences and expertise in Chinese paintings. So uh, we are very honored and delighted to have Yvette to speak at RAC Art Talks today. Yvette holds two master's degrees from the University of Sydney, one in museum studies and one in art history, for which she was awarded the Francis Stewart Prize for Outstanding Research in Asian Art. Yvette joined Bonnemers in 2011 as an Asian art specialist and works closely with Bonnemers International Asian Art Department. And under her management, the Asian Art Department has achieved record-breaking results and growth. In today's talk, Yvette will share with us some untold tales of how art moves with the people as a result of a tremendous life events, which have often been overlooked in academic discourse. And also her own chance encounters with many great paintings. We will take questions from the audience at the end of Yvette's talk. So please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll take them up at the end of the talk. Now, please join me in welcoming Yvette Klein to give us the talk. Thank, thank you, Professor Jin Han, and hello, everyone. Let me try to share my slides from here first. Hello everyone, I would like to begin today's talk by acknowledging the Gadigal of Ira Nation, the national traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to the elder by past and present. I'm very grateful for Professor Jing Han and the Institute for the opportunity to share some of my most unforgettable experience during my work. For the two previous lectures we had on this program, we had some fantastic insights and knowledge from an artist and an art historian. Today, there will be entertaining anecdotes and unverifiable oral history, the sort of stuff that are not generally written into a serious discourse. Apologies in advance to art historians in my audience today. In the next few slides, I'd like to tell a few stories which were told to me by people who I encountered during my work and paintings I found in Australia, which had an extraordinary chain of problems. They are stories of how art moved with people, how art changed hands. They're stories of the rise and fall of family, personal fear of fortune, stories of human struggle in the face of great turmoil. The works I will use here are all by artists through Chinese background and all their owners too. Some artists in these stories lived and died in imperial China, but majority of the artists and owners spent or have spent considerable part of their life outside China. 
I would like to start my first story today with probably the most unusual story I've heard during my 10 years of experience. This is a painting I saw for a valuation, not something I sold in one of our sales. And the owner had asked me um, that I didn't use the image and did not disclose full names or stories not in the public domain. So um, apologies again. So this is a visit to Brisbane in 2016 uh, to see a collection of Chinese paintings. In my client's living room uh, hangs a long landscape paintings by C.C. Wong, who had been living in New York since 1949. C.C. Wong is probably more famous for being a collector of classic Chinese paintings than an artist himself. Works formerly from Wong's collection are uh, in many important public university collections in America, including those in Cleveland, Bonn, uh, Boston, San Francisco, Chicago, and Princeton, and some 60 works in the Metropolitan Museum. The image on the right is the cover of the catalog of an uh, exhibition held by the Met in 1999 of nearly 100 works from the collection. Um, as an artist, Wong himself explores a renewed and more abstract form of Chinese landscapes, drawing his inspiration from masters. The painting I saw in the living room is one of the early attempts in such. Because I can't show the work I saw, I thought I'd show a comparison between a work from his collection and one of his own paintings sold by Bonhams recently to illustrate his experiment. The one on the left is a painting by Wang Meng in 1354, one of the four great masters during the Yuan Dynasty. And the one on the right is by Cici si Wang himself in 1985. Wang preserves the cunfa or shading of the rocks and dian tai or the dotting of moss, but makes the outline of the mountains more angular and the composition fuller. This lineage of modernization of traditional landscape continues with Arnold Chang, who studied under C.C. Wang. Arnold Chang was born in New York, and I understand that he is never happy about his calligraphy, so he always asks someone else to inscribe on a painting for him. So when art moves overseas, the painting goes modernized, but the calligraphy extinct. Back to our Brisbane living room. So my client asked me, do you know how this painting ended up here in my living room? And then she proceeded to tell me the story. Cici Wang used to study painting under Wu Fu Fan. This is another uh, very well-known name during the Republic of China. And befriended another student, Mr. Dong, who is in turn a friend of my client's father, Mr. Sun. At this end, um, at the end of the civil war in China in late 1940s, Mr. Dong and Mr. Sun both fled to Hong Kong with no much money at all on them. Mr. Dong is also, uh, uh, also studying a Song Dynasty School of Astrology or fortune telling. This particular branch of astrology consists of 12 books, six of them on how to tell the past and six how to tell the future. When he flees mainland, he has um, a choice of either taking with them the books of the past or the books of future. He, um, I can only assume that um, they take a rather large room in his luggage. He chooses the past and shortly after starts his fortune telling business in Hong Kong. Even with just a half of the volume and only being able to tell the past, Miss Dong is quickly able to establish himself and afford an apartment in Hong Kong with a mortgage. And he thinks to himself, I must return to China to recover the six books of future with me so that the service I offer is complete. That is um, in early 1950s when the political climate in the mainland is taking turn for the more oppressive. Shortly after he returns to China, he is trapped and can't escape. He asks help from Mr. Sun, who is in Hong Kong, to pay for his mortgage for the time being. Ms. Sun doesn't have any money, and uh, Mr. Dong says, I have a painting in my apartment by C.C. Wong. Use that painting as a guarantee and go to see so-and-so who lives in the peak to secure a loan for me. Mr. Sun does all that, and Ms. Dong's mortgage is safe for the time being, whilst he figures out a way to escape again. 
After many months, he eventually is able to escape with the future books, and he returns to thank to both creditor and so-called borrowing agent. The creditor doesn't want to keep the painting, saying that he has no interest in it and gives it to Mr. Sun, and then it passes to my client when he passes away. And that's how I got to see it when I was in Brisbane. This Mr. Dong later becomes an extremely celebrated, expensive, and apparently reliable fortune teller. Many celebrities from Hong Kong have a story or two about how well his advice have served them. And one of them is the second artist in our talk today, Irene Chow. Irene Chow probably is one of the earliest migrating Chinese artists in Australia has seen. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Similar to many characters in the previous story, she also fled Shanghai to Hong Kong in 1949. She met our Mr. Dong in Hong Kong out of coincidence during her uh, 50s, which would make it 1970s, and sat for a session with Mr. Dong, during which time she was told of the following verdict. Which I translate, I translate here. The South is of great fortune. Remember one word to paint, do not stop. There is a hidden disease in you, do not fear. Irene Chow initially was quite puzzled by Nan Fang Dali, the South is of great fortune, as she thinks that Hong Kong cannot be of any more South. In the end, the history will have it that um, in light, late 1970s, Chow's husband passed away and shortly after she had a stroke and moved to Brisbane to be closer to her son and continued painting well into her 80s. In Hong Kong, Chow was one of the pioneers in the New Ink movement, and she continued her experiment after she moved to Australia with elements and inspirations she found in this movement. This is a painting by Chow I found in Brisbane in a deceased estate of a former Catholic priest. During the 1950s, Chow studied under Zhao Shaoang, and uh, the Zen Buddhism inspired bold brush strokes which later would become Chow's signature, wasn't defined until the 1980s. So I'm guessing that um, this painting was probably done during 1960s, where Chow explored a variety of styles, trying to find her own path. Curiously, this painting is signed twice with one seal. Today, I still quite can't work out the reason. Both Chow and Cici Wong belong to a group of artists outside mainland China trying to modernize Chinese paintings. With Chow, it also poses a question many contemporary artists faced, which is how to respond to the new landscapes surrounding them when they move to a new environment. Guang Wei, in his first lecture, touched upon this question. The artists of our generations are still working in progress on their own reflection. Let's move back in time with our next story, an album by the 17th century artist Yun Shaoping. Yun Shaoping is probably better known for um, his so-called boneless flowers, which sometimes makes the landscape all the more valuable. In this album of 10 leaves, Yun paints each landscape after a style of a different master from the Yuan Ming dynasty, but ultimately with his own interpretation. In here, even the most, sorry, I just lost my uh, screen here. Ah, in here, even the most severe minimalist artist like Ni Zan takes on the hue of soft pink and green, and his dry brush becomes Yun's delicate strokes. The album is covered with seals of which the artist himself does not leave a lot except for the ones that are close to the inscriptions. The rest almost all belong to a 19th century collector, Yang Jizhen. And this is what is easily discernible as the history of the album. What is untold of its journey through time after is rather quite something. In one ordinary day in November, 2017, an email came to me with a title, Ancient Chinese Paintings. 
And when I opened it, it contained photos of this most tiresome looking cover. But following it were photos of these beautifully painted landscapes. Just within a few hours, I made a decision to meet with the sender. This is a family uh, which not long ago migrated to Australia from Tangshan in China. And they lived in this small mining town called Youyangs, not far away from the Avalon Airport. I booked a, an Airbnb there. And for the past 10 years of my career, I would say Little River B&B is Yoyang's in Yoyang was probably the most out of nowhere and humble place I stayed. I include a photo from Google Maps for evidence. I met with the family. They had a daughter who was um, of the same age as me and had similar experience of studying working overseas before settling in Australia. The father always knew that the album was something. And the father said during the Republic period, the family had a branch which was affiliated with the government. When they lost the civil war, that branch fled Taiwan and took with them most of the valuable possessions, but left his father with his album as a token. They came the culture revolution. The family home was ransacked, but the album was such an, an in conspicuous thing that it voided the avoided the rear guard's attention when everything else was destroyed. The, fa the, the father said we lost everything because we had relatives in Taiwan. And then, of course, having a home in Tangshan, what was left after Cultural Revolution was again flattened during the magnitude 7.6 earthquake in 1976, which killed nearly a quarter of a million people. Another photo to show the aftermath of the earthquake. And then he said, miraculously, the urban survived again and we didn't lose it thanks to the fact that it was not fragile and it was flat. Now uh, we want to sell it so that our daughter can have a decent start in her life here. We want her to be able to afford something in Melbourne, not here out of nowhere in your youngs. We don't want, uh, we, don't, we don't have large sum of money. This is the only valuable thing we have. Due to my work, I meet regularly with people who say something like this. People come to us thinking um, their family airborne will bring them a nice apartment. But most of the time, yeah, one gets a decent holiday if one's lucky. But this time I found myself in a very fortunate position that I could be of help. We sent the album to our Hong Kong office for sale. They did a fantastic job packaging the album. Our team framed temporarily each of the 10 leaves and displayed them in the main hall. The moment anyone came through the door, it was the first thing they saw. I went to the Hong Kong uh, office for sale. As I stood in front of the ultra sleek museum-like setup of the album, what I couldn't help imagining was how it laid unnoticed whilst the red guard smashed everything around it and how it laid unscathed when the entire city was being flattened. It had witnessed such extraordinary violence yet it stood the test of centuries and now it greeted the world with open leaves again. The um, main artist of our next story is Wu Dongfang, an 18th, 19th century scholar specialized in a Chinese form of epigraphy called Jing Shi, literally meaning metal and stone. And is a study of mainly early bronze and scripts such as oracle and seal scripts this is a book of 10 painted leaves, each accompanied by an inscribed leaf of poems. With um, two leading prefaces, one by Wu Dongfa himself, when the album was painted in 1979, and the other by Pan Beishen in 1932, when the album was remounted. Pan is a scholar calligraphist active in Shanghai. Of the 10 painted leaves, Wu did four. His friend Fang Mengkui painted another four and his son painted um, the last two. By the late 18th century, what we understand as Chinese landscape paintings have very much been formalized. 
there is hardly much innovation and we often regard a lot of landscapes created during the 18th, 19th century as a shell of its former glory. Occasionally one finds a rule breaker and it happens quite often with the group associated with epigraphy. This album, unlike humble cover of our pre-story, wears what it is on its sleeve. Well, not quite um, its sleeve, but on its title slip. The title slip reads, Wu Kan Shu, Shan Ren, Hua Shi Ce, Dao Yuan Tai Shou Zhen Nong, Pan Fei Shen Shu. I translate here, album of landscape and poems by Wu Kan Shu, which is Wu Dongfang's star name, treasured collection of Dao Yuan Tai Shou. Dao Yuan, uh, Tai Shou is a ministerial position, similar to modern day head of a county or city and inscribed by Pan Fei Shen, who was the person who wrote the second preface mentioned in the previous slide. The cover uses a, a mix of a walnut and rosewood. The grain itself looks like an abstract landscape painting. It comes with a silver pouch as well, a bit torn, but you can still see the, the woven brocade and the contrasting colors of the cover and the lining of still very vibrant purple and sea green. Unlike the Yun Shouping album, a lot of the history was written in the preface of this album. Wu Dongfang describes that he and his friend Fa Mengkui comes across um, this collection of poems by a mutual friend. Both of them then decide to paint landscapes according to the verses in a poem, and um, um, even Wu's son joins them. In Pan Fei-shen's preface, it talks about how Wu and Fang's associates and friends all contribute further poems next to landscapes, and this album has long been in the collection of Dao Yuan Tai Shou. There is this line here which reads, Xin wei la yue nian yi ru huo bei bing jing, pao da zhen tian, and follows with the rest. I translate here, 21st day of the last month of the Ye Xingwei, heavy fighting breaks out in north of Shanghai. Fire breaks the sky. Both Dao Yuan Tai Shou and I are caught up, caught up in this crossfire. We can't bring anything with us when we escape. A month or so passes, we manage to return to our former resident and salvage this album and two pieces of furniture and ask them to be safely transferred. As if all was protected by the gods. So I went to look up which day it was, 21st of last month, the Xinwei year, and it turned out to be 28th of January, 1932. And guess what? I've learned of this history class, and this is the famous ER Bar Shibian, or the January 28th Shanghai incident, when an anti-Japanese occupation protest ends up with riots, heavy fighting, burning, and military engagement. This is an amazing stuff. How often does a history episode that you studied so hard as a part of your or education or patriotism that it got carved into a brain and later come face to face with a piece of Sijo, the four oaths, which was something to be destroyed during counter revolution. Within the album, there are also two loose leaves um, of someone copying or studying the running script trying to put punctuation to the text and also ask himself whether this first character is actually what he thinks it is. The red watermark template says letter paper of the tax office in Suzhou, Zhejiang and Anhui provinces, Republic of China. I suspect that the handwriting is by Dao Yuan Tai Shou himself, the former owner of the oven. We know that he works for the government and he uses his office stationery for his purpose. There is a modern school of um, history criticizing imperial Chinese bureaucracy being composed by a majority of scholar officials, scholar mainly of literature and history subjects, which resulted in this vast empire and its vast population be managed by this class, which lacked scientific insights or method of management. And then you see that in action. Tax office stationery used to study writings of epigraphic scholars, probably during office hour as well. These are all um, 
joy during my work. All of these in jokes or anecdotes sometimes confirm, sometimes ridicule, and sometimes even contradict what I've studied and known before. This album ended up in Hong Kong during the 1940s and it was sold by a dealer there in the 1980s to a bank manager posted to Hong Kong from Singapore, which is just one of many artworks I found in Australia with which traces its history from Hong Kong, Singapore or Taiwan, where a lot of people either moved or fled during the first half of 20th century. I know um, Professor Jing Han queued for this Xu Bei Hong last month, so I thought I must mention it. Similar to the Wu Dongfa painting, which was rescued during the war, this Xu Bei Hong was smuggled out of China just before 1949 by my vendor's father, who was still a teenager. When I met with him in Sydney in 2020, he had all but forgotten his Chinese. He said his father sent him to a boarding school here in Sydney just before 1949, and he left Shanghai in a backpack with this painting rolled up. He had no idea who the artist was, but the words by his father was that this is very, very valuable. Then he asked me, is it? And then I said, yes, oh yes. So um, magpies on plum blossoms is very auspicious symbol in Chinese culture. Magpies in Chinese is called xi chue, xi being the word meaning happiness. Plum blossoms in Chinese is called mei, a homophone for the word eyebrow. So magpie on plum blossom as a symbol in Chinese is called xi shang mei shao, which paints a very poetic image that a face is brimming with happiness. It overflows to the tip of eyebrows. It is a, a lucky painting too that even though the little boy did not know anything about it, he took care of it for more than half a century. Art historian of 20th century Chinese art all know the important two locations, Shanghai and Hong Kong, to artists, which are the two locations repeatedly mentioned in today's talk. In the album we talked about just now, Pan Feishen, a native of city of Pan Yu in Guangdong, worked and lived in both Shanghai and Hong Kong. In the decades following Britain's lease in the new territory, the city saw an influx of migrants, which reached a peak during 1930s and 40s. The artist of our next story is, or the artists of our next story, is a group of late Qing scholars, officials of native Guangdong province, who moved to Hong Kong during or by the 1930s. These are six framed calligraphy I found in Bellevue Hills of all places in New South Wales at an elderly lady's home up in the hills. As the elderly lady greeted me when I went to visit her, she herself obviously Chinese, and she asked me where I was from. I said Shanghai, and she just started talking in a Suzhou accented Shanghai dialect. I couldn't believe my ears. You don't hear Suzhou accented Shanghai dialect anymore in Shanghai nowadays because it is a thing belongs to a distant past in Shanghai's history when it received migrants from nearby towns such as Suzhou, Hangzhou, Yangzhou, etc. during the first half of the 20th century. When we were growing up in Shanghai, our elder generations all spoke the Shanghai dialect with certain accents depending on where they had moved from. When I was in school, all our teachers of certain age all carried with them accents, um, which were constantly mimicked and ridiculed by us who have grown up in Shanghai. Probably the most recognizable accent of all would be that from Suzhou. And my grandma um, happened to be from Suzhou as well, so it's added a sentimental feelings when this old lady started telling me about the history of the calligraphy. She said she was from a prominent family in Suzhou and she married someone in Guangzhou. They moved to Hong Kong during the 1930s. The Shangkuan Ren, uh, the person all these calligraphy is dedicated to, is called Gong Fu, was a senior member from her husband's family. And she said herself studied calligraphy with Chen Guangyue. And she was a good friend with Wen Su's son. She said that this calligraphy is a result of a banquet in 1932 that Gong Fu held with the artists, during which each artist wrote something for him. Of these artists, we have Zhu Ruzhen, 
who is famous uh, for being the Bang Yan, which is the silver medal of the last ever imperial examination in 1904. Ou Da Ren, scholar of Hanlin Academy in Beijing, who moved to Hong Kong to be a teacher. Wen Su, who um, in 1932, that is two decades after the collapse of the Qing Dynasty in British controlled Hong Kong, still called himself Qing Chen Wen Su, official of the Qing Dynasty. And Xie Kun Yi, maybe nowadays long forgotten, but every Chinese knows the name of Xie Xian and Xie Tingfeng, the father and son duo who are descendants of Xie Kun Yi and who dominated the popular culture scene in Hong Kong from the 1960s till even now, their scandalous personal story overshadowing their career of singer, songwriter, actor, and what have you. In history books, we learned that the Qing Dynasty largely inherited the structure of bureaucracy of Ming Dynasty, and the Republic government is altogether not so much a different animal from the Qing Dynasty. Even though the imperial dynastic lineage stopped with the Republic of China. Much of the old way continued for decades following, not only in places like Shanghai where it's foreign concessions, but also in Hong Kong, presumably under a colonial rule. People having banquets, drinking games or gatherings and having so-called more about their paintings or calligraphies is a millennium old tradition of how artists and scholars entertain themselves. Today, we're still telling the story of Lanting, a fourth century drinking game attended by scholars and poets, and numerous occasions alike recorded with calligraphy and paintings. One of them is in our next Asian Art Sale in August. If you are interested, come and have a look at your preview from the 4th of August. Let me plug myself just like a podcaster. The role of um, Tai Shou in Dao Yuan Tai Shou in one of our previous stories was abolished during the Republic period. However, it never stopped being an honorific salutation for someone once held a position. And there were so-called Yi Ming continued calling themselves remaining subjects of the Qing dynasty. Zhu Ruzhen capitalized his position as the last Bang Yan of the millennium old imperial exam and commercialized his calligraphy for rich merchants and people in power. He is one of many people who were forced to commercialize themselves following the fall of the imperial system. In fact, Hong Kong became such a safe haven for people during tumultuous years. Many artists ended up in Hong Kong, such as Li Yanshan, Ding Yanyong, Zhao Shaolang. Many were from the neighboring Canton province, whose work I also repeatedly found in Australia. They established themselves as commercial artists. They taught the next generation of artists in their own practice, and they also taught in universities. The following decades, the art scene in Hong Kong enjoyed such a creative explosion, explosion with the con continuation of old tradition and exploration of contemporary ink. It continued to explore talent and their work. One of the main reasons why Australia has seen so many artworks by these artists due to its proximity to Southeast Asia when art moved with people. More than Hong Kong, Taiwan being the destination where the Republic government fled, it brought there not only politicians, militants, but also artists, scholars, and scientists, and so much more. Amongst them, one of the most prominent artists of his time, Pu Ru, who is also a cousin of the last emperor and also the artist of our next story. Over the years, I've found quite a few Pu Ru in Australia. The most interesting and sensational piece by him, however, is not a painting nor a calligraphy, but some inscriptions he left in the margin of a book. This is um, the first edition of Gardens of China composed by art historian Oswald Siren and was gifted to Zhang Jinghu, J.H. Chang by the author. Siren was a Finnish born Swedish art historian whose interest included the art of the 18th century Sweden, Renaissance Italy and China. Gardens of China draws comparison between Chinese landscape paintings with classical Chinese paint gardens. 
Chang was a Taiwanese educator, geographer specialized in Asian climate change and the agricultural development of mainland China and Taiwan. I came across this book in uh, Melbourne. My client is a widower who is selling her late husband's collection. She said her husband's family had fled Taiwan from Shanghai during the late 40s, and her husband bought this book from a secondhand shop in Taipei. As we flipped through the book, we came across this portrait, and I just jumped. That is Pu Lu himself. And next to the portrait, his handwriting in brush. I was um, very proud of myself for recognizing his face, as well as his writing immediately without reading much the instruments. In the margin of this page, Puru writes, this photo was taken when I was 36 years of age. Nine years after I had returned from Germany with two and a doctorate degrees, and my mother asked me to continue studying. A sidetrack here, by the way, um, during Puru's time, many had speculated the authenticity of his doctorate degrees, which was a constant sore point for him. Puru's portrait appears amongst the pages of Prince Gong's mansion and gardens. A lot of listeners who are in, interested in Chinese porcelain and works of art are probably more familiar with Prince Gong's mansion with a famous sale in Chinese antiques organized by Yamanaka Company in 1930 to aid restoration of the Qing dynasty. Many of the treasures found in International Museum are uh, result of this sale. To date, it is one of the best preserved imperial mansions. The copy of the original catalog occasionally grace international auctions and they constantly set you back for tens of thousands of dollars. The vendor of the sale, the past, the last Prince Gong of the Qing Dynasty was Puru's elder brother. Puru grew up in a mansion himself and naturally becomes the authority of the gardens. Within the books, he writes in various pages, correcting naming errors of various gardens and also recounting anecdotes of various places. In this page, he writes, this is Liu Beiting. During the old time, there was a stone stele. When I was nine years old, I tried to climb onto the stele and it broke and nearly crashed and killed me. And then it was removed. And then in this page, he quotes a famous verse from a poem by the last king of the Southern Tang Dynasty, Li Yu, during his imprisonment by the founding emperor of the Song Dynasty, Zhao Kuangying, lamenting his old days. I translate here. The carved columns and jade steps are probably still there, but the face changed. For this poem, he was poisoned by Zhao Kuangying and died of a slow and painful death in confinement. But his poem continues to echo through Chinese history and becomes the epitome of the cycle of dynasties in Chinese. We can only imagine Puru's sentiment when coming across these photos of himself and his old residence in Taiwan. Well, these are some of the most unforgettable stories that I would like to share with you today. I picked them for the most dramatic and entertaining effort. There are many more works I found here which um, has had a much peaceful transition. For the benefit of both art and artists, I hope that more and more artworks found their way into their new homes with a more boring chain of provenance. But let us not forget um, those extraordinary journeys some have to endure and thank whoever who bestowed with the burden of care for this legacy of humanity, without whom so much more would have been perished into the oblivion of history. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Yvette. Oh, well, I've never been to a lecture like this, you know, so amazing, amazing stories. As you said, it's really connecting what things would be abstract to many people, including myself. Now it's just so like with the blood and the flesh, it's just tremendous. Yes, we are Thank now you. open to questions, but before we start, you know, our collected audiences of questions, I have a couple of questions to ask. One is a simple one. I'm quite amazed by your knowledge, you know, level of knowledge and the width in this wide range. 
because of the you uh, the the job you do, you need to be able to read classic Chinese. You know, I that's not easy at all. Um, how do you get that knowledge, and how much do you need that in your job? Um, well, I actually grew up with um, uh, traditional Chinese writing system. I was um, forced by my mom to practice calligraphy every day. Um, my grandpa um, used to be a painter and he was actually my tutor. Um, well, actually my Chinese level is just gumshili <laughs> high school <laughs> graduate. Um, but um, even after I left uh, Shanghai, I continued to read and um, study and sort of never stopped with me. I still um, carry with me um, a very old dictionary, um, uh, which was previously owned by my um, grandpa. So that dictionary, I'm not sure if you can yeah. read of the different forms of Chinese writing from mm. regular script, running script, all, all the way until the seal script. And I used it almost every day when I catalog. Wow, it is really, really amusing. Uh, I'm amazing. Um, I just uh, share with the Jocelyn, uh, Jocelyn Chase comment, dear Yvette, I'm, I'm lost in nostalgia. Thank you for sharing so many touching stories. They are truly uh, touching. I also want to ask you another question because um, you know those stories sort of have a good ending in a way because in the end, like they are rescued and survived through all sorts of unimaginable, you know, earthquake, cultural revolution, migration, as well as many natural disasters or movements. Is there any story that you actually found quite sad? Is it because of the tragic loss? Um, I, I suppose you, one doesn't know what one doesn't know. Yeah. I, um, they, uh, of course, with the, there were clients who were uh, talking about how some of the pieces are lost. Uh, sometimes it was due to a theft. Sometimes it was simply because they couldn't carry with them um, everything. And um, um, the um, the widower of uh, the first the, the Garden of China was telling me the story that um, her her mother-in-law, which is her late husband's mother, was telling her when people were fleeing China and those who could get onto the boat account themselves lucky ones. And those who couldn't were genuinely throwing gold at people who were already on the boat, begging for a position. Um, so uh, I suppose that there's just so much more that was lost in the history and we can only be joyful of the ones that are still still there regardless of their type journey i'm also curious about the um kind of the the trace when you identify or discover you know like looking for gold or for opal once they found one one part and usually that leads to there are some you know, natural trace in the mineral that would lead them um, to the next bigger discovery. Do you find any patterns, you know, through your 10 years of experience? Like if, if you discover one, would that one probably meet you to the, lead you to the next discovery? Is there any link or pattern? Um, yes, the definition is, um... Some of our uh, most um, fantastic consignments were actually uh, recommended um, to us by people who previously uh, sold things with us. Um, sometimes they also know people who had things. Sometimes they know, um, the, usually um, I, I would say things doesn't happen out of a vacuum. Things doesn't happen for no reason. Um, and I, I suppose from um, all the stories I told just now, one can also see a bit of um, 
uh, a societal stagnation in the sense that everyone who uh, involved in the stories who are from absolutely privileged class, every single artist in the story just now um, and every single um, owners as well. So it's, um, it's a story of generational wealth. It's probably a story of um, uh, a problematic up, upward mobility in, in our society today. In, in that um, people who are born with privilege, who are born with all this wealth, will continue to be um, wealthy and successful. So uh, that's another side of the story as well. And for us, um, yes, we um, when we when we do consignment, we uh, tend to work very closely with um, the dealers or, or the people who used to be dealers who knew these families or who knew these collections. Um, we work quite closely with um, some of the universities as well, because um, they would have patrons. Um, sometimes so that these patrons would donate, sometimes so these patrons would just sell. Um, so yes, sometimes it is, um, uh, it, it can be like walking in a desert without aim, but sometimes you can also, in a word called shuntan mo gua, you um, trace the vines and to find the watermelon at the end. Yeah. That's uh, so uh, so interesting. And also um, on on that topic, what's the process of a verification? You know, someone where you stump on something, and what's what do you need to go through to arrive at to the final confirmation of this is genuine artwork about who? What's the process? Um, I think for the things that I've um, told stories of tonight, they're quite straightforward. Uh, some of them uh, we've just um, collected seals all over them, and some of them with a, a very good chain of provenance. Sometimes we can rely on these provenance for authentication. Um, um, other times you can just, um, it's just by looking at thousands and thousands of paintings and know um, whether this artist did this kind of style during that particular time. Um, sometimes um, you can tell by um, the age of the mounting because um, late Qing Dynasty mounting of scrolls is very different from Republic period mounting, which is in turn also very different from the sort of mounting that they did in Hong Kong during the 60s. Sometimes you can rely on these circumstantial evidence to sort of work out how old uh, the painting might be. So for 20th century um, paintings, uh, it's more straightforward because uh, many of the stakeholders are probably still alive. You can consult people who knew them. You can probably consult their families. Sometimes they're still around. But as the artists become um, um, a further, further away into the past, such as um, a 17th century, 18th century, artists become even more and more problematic. So sometimes even um, um, panel of specialists cannot decide on, on on one decision whether a painting is genuine or not. And sometimes it's just um, a really an unsolved problem and it can stay unsolved for many, many years to come. So I imagine you would have some collection of those unsolved ones. Hold down. Yes. To mm. Yes. <laughs> That's really interesting. Wow. So yeah. many interesting things I want to ask. I, I see a question from Tai, um, who is our adjunct professor, and he said uh, very interesting stories. Has any great artwork previously owned by private individuals ended up in Australia national or state museums or galleries? Yes, as a matter of fact, definitely yes. Um, 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 I think um, for what I've known, um, Australia, uh, Art Gallery New South, uh, Art Gallery New South Wales and um, um, the National um, Gallery in Canberra and also NGV, um, uh, they all accepted donations from uh, families who brought with them great paintings, sometimes with great provenance. So a lot of these stories um, 
uh, of these paintings if they didn't end up uh, with us in um, international auctions, they may end up in um, public institutes. And I, I myself have seen quite a few. And I know quite um, a few instances where people donated very happily to public institutes. Mm. Following on that question, um, the stories you shared with us today, today are primarily sort of um, older migrants who you know, brought these paintings or artworks with them. Do you see any new migrants, like uh, migrants of the last uh, 10 or 20 years, do they bring things that are like old paintings or old artworks so that it would end up in your hands? Uh, uh, usual things actually um, from a new migrant because they when they moved to China, uh, moved to um, Australia not long ago. We um, see paintings more uh, in older migrants uh, with newer migrant occasionally, yes, but the artists um, that they have in their collections are also newer artists. So um, maybe not, um, maybe 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 not new migrants uh, within the last twenty years. But we've seen migrants probably uh, move to Australia during the nineteen eighties. A lot of them actually are also from Hong Kong, who had during their time collected artists of twentieth century artists such as Zhao Shang. Yang Shanshen, um, who those those two artists who actually worked in Hong Kong as well during the 50s and 60s. And many of them were telling me stories of how they remember their parents used to bring them to uh, Zhao Shang Yang Shanshen studios to ask for paintings. So a lot of these paintings are actually inscribed, um, dedicated to some of the family members. And we found that a lot in Australia. Um, Possibly not with very new migrants, but uh, a lot of these working artists also visited Australia during the 1980s. Well, Zhao Shang, Yang Shenshen again, and Guan Shan Yue, um, who I believe had um, a joint exhibition with the Art Gallery New South Wales. So when they visited, they also brought with them paintings and left behind paintings in Australia to be found. With the um, new migrants, we've seen work um, of um, late 20th century Chinese contemporary artists um, active in China during the 80s. And when they moved, um, a lot of them moved to Australia around 1989 of that incident <laughs> we know of what happened and um, brought with them what they valued and what they had when they moved. So each generation um, will bring with them a different a sort of art and um, um, I just can only hope that Australia see a more and more new generation of um, migrants who will come to Australia with um, even more greater arts. You answered my uh, next question. So there is kind of a no such a thing as uh, those artworks will be exhausted because as you mentioned, new generations that they bring new artworks and uh, artworks of like youngish um, mm. artists about by the time they get old, you know, these new migrants, when they get old, the yes. artists' works that, that they bring also become like old. So yeah. there will be no exhaustion. So they will be ongoing, isn't it? <laughs> Very optimistic. And um, I want to um, add that um, continuing from the 1980s, uh, there are wave of um, artists who moved to Australia as well. So um, artists such as Guan Wei who uh, gave a talk um, um, in, in, in the first of this uh, lecture series. A lot of artists who left China and moved here in 1980s, a lot of them continue painting. So um, in their cases, they didn't bring any art with them, but they created art in here, in this new land that they found. Yeah, that's so true. Mm. I, I can't let you go without asking this question. You know, um, it is a quite amazing. I don't know anyone who actually doing this work and ha knowing so much. And um, what, so on a personal level, what brought you onto this profession? Like you were born with interest in the, you know, uh, uh, 
appreciation of artwork. So how did you, in, you know, like a stumble, it's not stumble, do you, how do you get into this profession? I did really stumble into it. <laughs> um, so yes, I studied um, art history with the University of Sydney, but um, um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I basically volunteered with um, institutes such as the University of Sydney Museum, Art, art Gallery New South Wales. And it was actually from uh, the Art Gallery New South Wales, I was recommended to Bonhams when they were looking for someone who could catalog um, Chinese art. So um, it, it, it was good luck, um, um, but, but I, I should think I also brought with me uh, with some basic trainings of, you know, calligraphy and, um, and knowing a, a bit of Chinese history. More than a bit. <laughs> Is there any um, a lot? Um, a, a lot. I I also learn from working. So whenever there is a new piece of artwork presented with me, yeah. um, most of the time I don't immediately know what it is about. Or some of the time I know. Some of the times I don't. So there's a, a ongoing learning process when um, there is new challenge being presented. Uh, I think we have two more questions. I couldn't see them yet, but the last bit from me is, um, is there anything that are uh, uh, artwork that uh, you missed? And then you realized later, oh, you missed that one. You know, someone else got it. Um, we in Australia um, lost consignments constantly to auction houses in Hong Kong. Um, so there's no Christie's or Sotheby's in, in Australia, but um, um, and people nowadays don't bound it by their um, geography um, boundaries, and then they can send images over to Hong Kong. And sometimes um, I find myself not being quick enough. Sometimes I find myself um, with estimates too conservative. <laughs> so yes, um, there were fish that got away. <laughs> Just that to keep you awake at night. You yes, like <laughs> on my toes. <laughs> yeah. Well, such an interesting, you know, work and a tremendous knowledge that is required. Uh, I can't be grateful for this wonderful talk, Yvette. It's fascinating. It's truly fascinating. Thank you so much, Yvette. I just enjoyed, and I'm sure many of us enjoyed this a really interesting talk enormously and to anyone who have a mister we will obviously have a recording so we will put the recording after the uh, this talk um i would also like to announce that the next lecture of iec art talks will be given by dr alex birchmore from university of sydney who will talk about his newly published book entitled new export to china translations across a time and a place in contemporary Chinese porcelain art. Guess what? With a focus on the well-known artist ASEAN's porcelain busts. So the talk will be on Wednesday, 26th of J July at the same time, five o'clock. And we will send you the invitation. You can lock to that time and date in your calendar. Thank you again, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you, Professor Jihan.